Thank you, everybody, and welcome to the San Diego Civil Surgeon's new Mandatory TB Requirements webinar. We appreciate you joining us today. I'm Kelly Musoke, the director at the Curry Center. We have more than 60 people registered on our webinar. Today's session is being recorded and will be archived on our website. Please look out for an email announcing when it has become available in two to three weeks. All of our participants have been placed on mute in order to preserve the quality of our recording. If you have questions or comments during the webinar, please feel free to share them in the chat box, and our presenters will address them during the question and answer period at the end of the presentation as time allows. If you are listening via the phone, please enter the code provided to you within Adobe Connect to link your phone and computer if you haven't already done so. This code could, would be automatically displayed to you if you selected the phone option on the audio menu. It can also be located by clicking on the lowercase letter I in the upper right-hand corner. This can help us manage any audio problems that might arise. The Curry International TV Center, which is part of the University of California, San Francisco, is located in Berkeley, California. The Curry Center is one of four TV centers of excellence for training, education, and medical consultation. The Curry Center is accredited by the ACCME to provide continuing medical education for physicians. The Curry Center is also an approved provider of continuing education by the California State Board of Registered Nurses. This webinar is approved for a total of 1.5 continuing education contact hours. To receive CEU, you must register for the webinar, participate in the entire webinar, and complete the online evaluation. The evaluation link was emailed to all registered participants this morning, and we ask that you complete it within, within one week. Today's presenters have all signed a disclosure, a declaration of disclosure, and additional information can be found in our online materials folder. These are the learning objectives for our webinar today. And now I would like to review our agenda, introduce our speakers, and we will begin. So first we're going to be hearing from Laura Rakuljic, who is a Policy Educations Officer with the USCIS Office of Policy and Strategy. She began her career with the federal government in 2003 and has gained a wide variety of immigration experience with CDT and USCIS at offices in Washington, D.C., New York, and Connecticut. Following Laura, we'll be hearing from Dr. Drew Posey, who is the Medical Assessment and Policy Team Leader in the Immigrant, Refugee, and Migrant Health Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. <clears throat> Following that, we'll be hearing from Dr. Marissa Moore, who is a field medical officer with the CDC assigned to the County of San Diego TB Control and Refugee Health Branch. She leads the data unit for the County TB program, supporting public health surveillance, epidemiology, and program evaluation. In conclusion, we'll hear from Dr. Susanna Graves, who is the chief of the TB Control and Refugee Health Branch um, of Public Health Services for the County of San Diego. Prior to her role at the county, she served as the site director for UC San Diego's Global Medicine Residency Program in Mozambique, where her work focused on implementation of infection control measures, including TB screening among health workers. Dr. Graves and her team provide public health guidance and medical consultation regarding TB in San Diego County. At this time, I'd like to pass the virtual microphone to our first speaker, Laura. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My name is Laura Rukulczyk, and I am with the Office of Policy and Strategy. I will be giving a short presentation on the I-693. So let's jump right in. Just some reminders and disclaimers to get out of the way. Things are constantly evolving in the civil surgeon world. So this presentation is only valid as of the date of last revision. The most important thing to remember is that, you, that this training is for informational purposes only. And if you were to want to use it, you would need to get our permission first. I'll also note that uh, our organizers today will be 
providing a copy of this presentation and the others, so you will be able to reference it later, and I will breeze through kind of quickly due to time constraints. So let's start off by looking at the different approaches a foreign national may take when seeking a green card. The two processes to becoming a legal permanent resident, or LPR, are separated out on the chart before you. Okay, on the left side, we call uh, that consular processing, where the foreign national applies for an immigrant visa at a U.S. consular post abroad, and their medical examination is conducted by a panel physician. On the right side is adjustment of status, um, which involves filing the Form I-485. This is where you, the civil surgeons, will conduct the medical exam. So the reason that we have an immigration medical exam is to diagnose any medical condition which would make the applicant inadmissible and thus not eligible for adjustment of status unless he or she qualifies for a waiver. Following the exam and the rest of the 485 process, USCIS will make the admissibility determination. The civil surgeon records these findings on the I-693, and then USCIS reviews the 693 to help in the admissibility determination of an adjustment applicant. And of course, the medical exam is based on the CDC's technical instructions, or TIs, which are publicly available on the CDC's website. So we've all been waiting for this for a while. As of mid-July, we do have our new form. Um, as always, there is a grace period, but by September 23rd, we will no longer accept the old version. Even though the 60-day validity period and when the applicant files their I-485 is their responsibility, I do want to point out that you, as civil surgeons, uh, that USCIS will only accept the new version as of this date. And that's regardless of the date that the civil surgeon signs the 693. This means that an applicant who used the previous version of the form and it was signed after July 23rd may have their validity date affected in some way. So the next few slides detail some of the most commonly asked questions we get or the mistakes that we see. This preparer section is new to the form. It's located on page four. Even though it is in the applicant's portion of the form as far as responsibility, we have gotten a lot of questions from civil surgeons about it. A civil surgeon or anyone would only need to complete this portion if the applicant comes to them with a completely blank form and needs to have help filling it out for whatever reason. Simply transcribing or transferring information for the applicant's portion doesn't require one to complete the preparer section. Additionally, a parent or guardian completing the form for a child wouldn't have to fill it out. Okay, verifying identity. Uh, both the technical instructions and the form instructions require that the civil surgeon make every reasonable effort to verify that the person examined and tested is in fact the person identified in the form. Applicants generally must present a valid government-issued photo ID. We do get a lot of questions from civil surgeons asking what to do if the applicant does not have one. Since we can't go into every possible scenario, our, our answer is usually that the civil surgeon should use their discretion as to what to decide to accept. The idea is to make sure that the applicant for the immigration benefit is the same person who is presenting themselves for the medical exam. So if the ID used is somewhat unusual, but the civil surgeon does believe that the person is who they say they are, they should conduct the exam and take photocopies of the ID or documents provided and then write a little note explaining the circumstances. USCIS will then look into each case further and decide if there is reason not to accept it. This slide shows that the civil surgeon must complete part 10 to indicate the results of the vaccination record. In this case, the applicant met all of the requirements. However, uh, whatever the case may be, please complete part 10 by checking the results box. As with most of the common errors USCIS officers find, this is a simple one and easily remedied. Okay, beginning our final review. Before signing and dating the form on part seven, page six, please ensure that all follow-up evaluations and treatment are completed. Also make sure that all findings and results boxes are completed for each section. Um, please make sure that part six, the summary, 
which is on page five now, is completed. And also, please make sure that your applicant has signed and dated the form in your presence. So this is just a reminder to ensure that Part 6 is fully complete by marking A, B, or C in the summary of overall findings. This is a fairly common error when a civil surgeon forgets to mark that there was no Class A or Class B condition. Continuing the final review, we want to remind you that the date you actually signed the 693 is very important. Only sign and date after all aspects of the exam are fully complete and the applicant themselves has signed. We want to emphasize again that the date that the civil surgeon signs the form is what controls whether a vaccine is age appropriate. And it is also the date that determines the validity of the form. When everything has been completed, it is very important to remember to sign. Again, easy fix to a common error. This handy visual shows exactly where to sign right here in part seven on page six. You, as the civil surgeon, must actually physically sign it. This doesn't mean that your office manager can stamp it, and no one else can sign it for you. This slide summarizes the form instructions for placing the exam in a sealed envelope and what to write on the front and the back. Please remind your patients to not open the envelope because an unsealed envelope will not be accepted. And remember also to provide them a photocopy. Uh, this will hopefully lessen the chance that they will try and open it. So as we begin to wrap up, we've got a handy flow chart here to summarize the adjustment of status process. So a hopeful green card applicant decides to file for adjustment of status. This applicant makes an appointment with the civil surgeon and attends the examination. The applicant then takes the two forms and files for adjustment of status. USCIS makes an admissibility determination and adjudicates accordingly. If the 693 is missing anything, USCIS will issue a request for evidence to the applicant. And then, of course, at the initial exam or subsequent exams, the civil surgeon will refer the applicant as appropriate under the technical instruction. Okay, moving on to some housekeeping items. We need you to please keep us updated. Address and phone are important as well as email. Here at the Office of Policy and Strategy, we did recently roll out a new email box, which I will highlight in a couple of slides. We occasionally use this to send out notices to civil surgeons uh, regarding new forms, training opportunities, et cetera. But the last time we sent these emails out, we did get dozens and dozens of returns as undeliverable. So we really need you to update that where you, can, you will miss out on a lot of information if you don't make sure that's updated. And um, you can do this by emailing our friends at NBC Civil Surgeons. For quick reference, this slide contains the various legal authorities governing the LPR process. Uh, this slide contains some helpful general resources that civil surgeons may wish to keep handy. Here we have some useful tips regarding getting email updates relating to the 693. This is separate from updating your info with NBC Civil Surgeons. You can do this one by going to USCIS.gov and clicking on Get Email Updates and you can find more detailed instructions here on this slide about that. And if you'd like, you can sign up for different USCIS updates besides just civil surgeon and forms. And then we have some TB resources. And this slide contains additional resources specific to the vaccination requirements. Thanks so much for your attention. I will now turn it over to Dr. Drew Posey. Thank you all very much. It is, I'm delighted to be able to talk to you today about these tuberculosis updates to our technical instructions. Some of this, this audience is very familiar with, and uh, Laura covered some of it already. So immigrants are people who apply for and obtain U.S. immigrant visas overseas and become lawful permanent residents and their exam is done overseas by panel physicians. 
refugees, they're required to apply for adjustment of status at one year to become lawful permanent resident. But most of the medical exam, including the tuberculosis screening, is completed overseas. And the civil surgeon TBTIs do not apply to these two groups of people, their examinations overseas. Status adjusters, I think everyone on this call knows that these are people applying for lawful permanent resident status while already in the United States on other terms. And so they do go through the full medical screening exam with a civil surgeon. The medical examination and the technical instructions can only screen for conditions required by U.S. immigration laws and regulations and is not a complete medical evaluation, such as that you might receive at a yearly physical examination from a regular primary care physician. The TBTIs instruct civil surgeons on how the tuberculosis medical exam must be completed for status adjusters. Okay. You know, we released new technical instructions last October or that went into effect last October 1st. The primary changes are that civil surgeons must use IGRA instead of a tuberculin skin test in all applicants aged two years of age and older. Civil surgeons are to, at that point, begin reporting cases of LTBI to health departments. And we created a new category, Class B0, and that is for status adjuster applicants who completed tuberculosis disease treatment during their medical examination or status adjustment process. So let's next talk about the interferon gamma release assays or IGRA tests. As we mentioned, our old requirements for civil surgeons were last updated in 2009. And with that update, civil surgeons were required to use either an IGRA or a skin test in those applicants. So civil surgeons for nine years had the choice of either a skin test or an IGRA. However, during that time period, a lot more information became known on IGRA tests and recommendations for regular clinical practice had evolved on the IGRA test such that IGRA became recommended instead of skin tests in patients five years or older for a number of factors, but they included things that are pertinent for our group either have a history of BCG vaccine, vaccination or are unlikely to return to have their TST read. In particular, that history of BCG, since BCG vaccine is done in most countries around the world, that means that most status adjuster applicants will have been from a country that did BCG, and thus, when doing a test in, in those folks, IGRA would be, is the preferred test. But even for pediatric patients, uh, for children vaccinated with BCG or with non-tuberculous mycobacterium exposure, IGRA is preferred to avoid a false positive skin test. And that second part there, you know, the potential to have been exposed to non-tuberculous mycobacterium, uh, you know, this is very common in many countries, particularly countries from climates that are more hot and humid. Um, that so very common for people to in hot humid climates overseas that they probably have been exposed to non-tuberculous mycobacterium. We also had done some analyses looking at data from the overseas exam. So what we're referring to there is persons who get their examination done by a panel physician overseas. There's a system whereby our office gets the results of that exam if there was a risk of tuberculosis identified and sends that information to a receiving health department. And in the hopes that those immigrants and refugees after they arrive to the United States could be seen by a health department, have any TB issues followed up. And then there's a reporting system so that we could see some of the results of that exam to feed back into our overall evaluation and monitoring activities of the panel physician or the overseas screening program. Well, the panel physicians have also had 
a skin test or IGRA requirement uh, over the same period of time in which there was a choice, but only for children 2 through 14 in countries with a higher TB rate. And what we found is that um, of those who had a positive skin test or IGRA overseas, uh, most of the time it was a skin test being used overseas, and most of the time that test was being repeated after arrival to the United States. And that, uh, again, most of the time when that test was repeated, if there was a skin test positive overseas and an IGRA done in the United States, it was a negative IGRA 69% of the time. So this, along with the recommendations for clinical practice, really showed us the, how those recommendations were being put to use at a local level in one of our screening populations, meaning that we could see in this type of information the switch to IGRA and the uh, parameters of the IGRA test that are touted in terms of being a more specific test bearing true in some of our populations that the IGRA would be positive less frequently and thus more specifically than the tuberculin skin test. So that type of information helped uh, drive us to change our technical instructions so that the IGRA test is the only test that we would allow in uh, where we are doing the skin test or IGRA. Uh, so for what it's worth, both overseas and domestically, this switch was made. And for civil surgeons, so all applicants two years of age and older are required to have an IGRA test now. Okay, a subtle but important change we made in these instructions is that civil surgeons that are independent of health departments must not refer applicants to a health department for IGRA testing or for chest x-rays. All IGRAs and chest x-rays ordered by civil surgeons was, must be performed independently of a health department. Now, this was uh, a major change. As we all know, in the United States, the health departments represent the largest body collectively, uh, the largest collective body of knowledge on tuberculosis diagnosis and treatment. However, these tests and x-rays are widely available in the community. We received a lot of feedback in the lead up to changing these instructions from health departments saying that civil surgeons were merely just sending someone over to have these things done instead of taking care of it and try to do some analysis on that applicant before referral to a health department when that referral might be important. So we made this change in these instructions. Okay, now let's talk about the latent TB reporting requirement. We're going to zero in on that now. So latent tuberculosis infection. Latent tuberculosis infection, or LTBI, is the presence of mycobacterium tuberculosis in the body without signs and symptoms or radiographic or bacteriologic evidence of tuberculosis disease or extrapulmonary tuberculosis. Essentially, this is applicants who have a positive IGRA or a history of a positive IGRA, no signs or symptoms, and a chest X-ray that's not suggestive of tuberculosis disease or what would commonly be described as a negative chest X-ray. It is important to remember, LTBI is not a Class A medical condition. Uh, its classification is listed in the technical instructions as Class B2 TB, latent TB infection. In the old technical instructions, we recommended that civil surgeons report cases of LTBI to the health department. And many health departments gave us feedback that they want these reports, but that they were not receiving them. And, and the conundrum there goes back to what I mentioned earlier, that in general across the United States, the health departments do the majority of the bread and butter LTBI treatment. And so we want the, the right people to be able to get this information 
and act on it. So in the new technical instructions, civil surgeons are required to report LTBI cases to health departments. What we'd really like is civil surgeons to communicate with the health department of the jurisdiction of their applicants to coordinate the reporting. There, please remember, there is no requirement for these applicants with LTBI to present to the health department as part of their status adjustment process. There is also no requirement for these applicants to complete treatment for LTBI during the status adjustment process. And that is because LTBI is not a Class A condition or, in other words, LTBI is not an inadmissible condition. In essence, before I, I go over the last bullet, through the course of an evaluation for active or infectious tuberculosis, the civil surgeons are discovering and diagnosing applicants with latent TB. If they have latent TB, active TB has therefore been excluded. And so the applicant can continue on with their status adjustment process. The I-693 can be finalized and given to the applicant for such process. But we want the civil surgeon to also inform the health department about this person's LTBI in the hopes that they then can be given the opportunity to receive treatment for latent TB. At a minimum, the civil surgeon should include the applicant's name, contact info, IGRA results, and chest X-ray results to that health department. As it relates to the IGRA results, include the laboratory printout of the test that is performed. In other words, for both IGRA and T-SPOT, civil surgeons will get a laboratory report that will indicate if the test is positive or negative. But a lot of people at a lot of health departments and a lot of TB experts really value the full printout of the laboratory test that is performed. There are other values that have meaning, so please attach a printout of that full test result, not just the positive or negative result. Okay, some states already require LTBI reporting, and they may have a system in place for civil surgeons to report. Some may want additional information, and that's fine. Again, we really encourage civil surgeons to work proactively with their health departments on what is the best way to be relaying this information. And remember, LTBI does not delay the status adjustment process for the applicant. And that concludes the slides that I have. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, hi, uh, my name is Marisa Moore, and today I'm going to present to you Uh, the methods, methods to report latent TB infection to the county TB program in San Diego. Uh, the first method is the current method via the California TB Confidential Morbidity Report, or CMR, submitted to us via fax. And the new method, available in October, will be web-based reporting via the county web CMR provider portal. And I'll also briefly describe the county TB program response to LTBI reporting. First, I'd like to give you a quick refresher on how to report active TB. Please report presumptive or confirmed active TB to the county TB program intake nurse team by the phone and fax shown here. It is required by state regulation within 24 hours of diagnosis. Civil surgeons also should use this method to report any chest radiographic abnormalities consistent with possible active TB. And our intake Nurses will assist you as needed to obtain expert radiographic consultation, coordinate further evaluation such as AFB smear, PCR, and culture, and provide and facilitate expert clinical consultation.
The next few slides will review the current method of submitting an LTBI report via the California TB Confidential Morbidity Report. And this slide shows the first um, or the top part of that form. And here you can enter the patient's name, their address, phone number, and several other pieces of demographic information. And we appreciate the address because currently, uh, after we receive your LTBI report, we will send the patient a letter uh, recommending LTBI treatment and providing several options, including scheduling an appointment at the health department if they don't have health insurance. This is the middle section of the CMR report, and this is where the civil surgeon will enter their name, their contact information, and that helps us make sure that our mailing um, and email distribution lists are up to date, um, as well as that we can call you about um, a question on the form. And on the right-hand side of this um, section, there is the fax number to submit the form to, our intake nurse's phone number if you have a question, and we also ask you to uh, check the box yes under the question report based on a civil surgeon exam. And this is because in the future there will be other providers who will re be reporting LTBI um, that's not based on a civil surgeon exam. This is the bottom section of the confidential morbidity report, and there are four columns. You can complete the first column as shown here with the sample data to show that this is an LTBI report that they're infected with no disease. And then use the second column to enter the TB test information. And for a civil surgeon, you'll enter then under the interferon gamma release assay, the date collected, the test name, and the result, which will usually be positive, and then your imaging information, that it was a chest X-ray, the date performed, and usually the result will be normal unless you've already cleared it with us. The third column isn't used for LTBI reporting. And then you can use the fourth column to enter information on LTBI treatment. Shown here in the sample data, I've marked current treatment and that they're on a rifampin regimen and the date initiated. Um, and if they didn't start treatment with you, you can mark the box below and, and, the, and the reasons such as they were referred to their primary care provider. The next few slides will um, describe the new method of reporting LTBI um, in San Diego County. We expect that to be available in October. This will be web-based reporting via the provider portal of the County Communicable Disease Reporting System called WebCMR. And um, you can obtain a provider account using the WebCMR account request form that was included in email and mail distributions from our County TB program chief this summer or just fax a request for the form to LTBI reporting fax shown here. Individual accounts are needed for each person who submits reports, and access is obtained using an account username and password. This slide shows the WebCMR login screen for the provider portal, and here's where you would enter your username and password. When you log in, you will see this as an initial screen to initiate your report. As shown by the red arrow, you will click the button that says New, and that will create a new LTBI report. There are also several other functions on this page that include uh, conducting a search for previous reports that you've submitted, as well as a line list um, that displays recent reports your facility has submitted. This next slide um, shows what you will see after you um, click the New button, and you'll see a, a disease incident screen. And as step one shows here with the red arrow, first you're going to select the tuberculosis LTBI to start the form under the disease being reported field. Then as step two, you'll enter demographics into this tab on this screen. And then as step three, you will click the clinical info tab to enter the TB test information. And we don't use the laboratory tab for reporting of LTBI. And as you can see, the top part of the screen includes the patient name, the only required field, 
And we appreciate, again, you putting in the address and other information so we can contact the patient. This slide shows the bottom half of that dem demographics tab um, with the other information you can enter, including the phone number. In the future, we may do conduct outreach uh, to make sure patients are linked to care, so we appreciate that information. And the bottom, your information will be pre-populated as the submitter and the reporting source um, with the provider name. And then on that past page, you would um, click the clinical info tab, and this is what you would see. The top of that form is the initial patient evaluation. Fields that are shaded red are required. And first you want to answer the question, is this evaluation part of an immigration screening? Yes, civil surgeon exam. Because in the future, there'll be other providers who are reporting on for different reasons. And then you'll also want to at least answer the third question, which is, does the patient have signs or symptoms consistent with TB disease? And that's a required field. The next section is entitled, risk assessment and select identified TB risk factors. If you have collect those systematically, you can enter data there. That's, again, primarily for in the future when other providers are reporting LTBI. And then this is the next section of that clinical info tab. And this is where you would enter the IGRA information and chest imaging. As shown here, you can select the radio button for IGRA and then enter the test, which is usually going to be positive in this case, and then the test date and then the chest x-ray as the imaging type, the date it was performed, and the result, which will normally uh, or usually be normal. And then at the bottom of that clinical info tab, there is a section to enter latent TB infection treatment information. You can select the radial button LTBI treatment started and the date started as well as the treatment regimen. And then if, if you selected LTBI treatment not yet started, at the bottom of the slide shows where you can select a radio button for the reason, such as that you referred to another provider for treatment. And at the very bottom of that um, screen for the clinical info tab, you can enter primary provider contact information or another provider contact information if you did refer the patient for LTBI treatment. And on the, fine, on the previous screen, you would have uh, clicked the Submit button, and then you would get this screen, which shows the disease incident submission uh, with a message that you successfully sent a report to the health department with your name, the patient's um, name, and um, the disease, and the date reported. And there are also several buttons at the bottom. You can print a receipt. You can print an abbreviated disease incident. You can also create a new disease incident for the next patient on your list. Um, if you'd like to uh, submit an IGRA report or a chest x-ray report, you can add that to the filing cabinet. And you can also submit a new disease incident for the same patient if you have another reportable disease. So in summary, our current method in San Diego is to use the California TB Confidential Morbidity Report. You can download that form from our website and um, submit that via the fax number shown here, and then the number is also on the CMR. The new method for reporting LTBI available in October will be web-based reporting via the county web CMR provider portal. And you can submit a new user request form to create an account and obtain that from our recent email and mailing uh, this summer or fax a request to the, for the form to the fax number on the screen. Please feel free to address any LTBI reporting questions to me at the county TV program. My email and phone are on this slide. And as a reminder, report active TB disease and abnormal chest x-rays to the county TB intake nurses via the phone shown here. Thank you. And now I'll pass the virtual microphone to Dr. Susanna Gray. Thank you, Marisa. Um, and I wanted, I wanted to reiterate that the um, electronic web uh, version of the submission that Dr. Moore just went through uh, we anticipate will be available sometime in October. Um, I wanted to go through a brief overview of tuberculosis in San Diego County, as well as diagnostic workup and treatment for latent tuberculosis infection. Um, and uh, just at the end, if we have time, talk to you about the new San Diego County TB Elimination Initiative. 
and no conflict of interest to disclose. And um, the learning points of this talk will be, uh, what I mentioned, describing the local epidemiology, appropriately working up a possible case of tuberculosis, and then prescribing short course treatment for latent tuberculosis infection prescribed by the CDC, uh, uh, sorry, as recommended by the CDC. Um, as you can see, the incidence of tuberculosis in San Diego County, um, just as California and the U.S. as a whole, has decreased since a relative peak in the early 90s, late 80s, um, that um, mirrored the HIV epidemic. Um, and while rates have come down, as you can see in the last uh, five years or so, I, incidence rates have leveled out um, and less progress has been made toward decreasing tuberculosis incidence. Um, San Diego County, um, at, as in other jurisdictions, the tuberculosis incidence is highly variable. Um, and so it's important to realize that while we are one county, um, different areas in our county have highly different rates of tuberculosis. And some areas of the county, those ones in red, have rates that are um, above um, ab above the average incidence in the county of, of 6.8 to 7 per 100,000, um, and may be more reflective of um, incidences in um, moderate risk foreign uh, foreign countries that have higher incidence of tuberculosis, like Mexico. Our, our neighbor to the south. Um, and it's estimated that between 150 and 180,000 residents in San Diego County have latent tuberculosis infection. The lifetime risk of progression to disease um, for people with latent infection is about 5 to 10 percent, but it depends on their age and other medical comorbidities. In California, 80 percent of active disease is a result of reactivation of latent tuberculosis infection. In San Diego County, that number is about 75 percent. Um, the burden of latent TB um, is um, uh, both in California and, and in San Diego is not, um, is not generally recognized by lay people and is something that um, we're doing a lot of educating of the medical community to understand and to understand their patients' risk for progression to active disease. Um, and since as civil surgeons, we do a lot of TB testing um, of, a, of a population that is at risk for progression to tuberculosis because they're foreign born and may have been infected overseas, um, we wanted to make sure that we understand that this is an opportunity for these individuals to get tested. Um, with the a test that's most appropriate for them, given that they're foreign born, many from countries with higher incidence, the IGRA test um, is what you would want to use, um, and it's now required. Um, and of those who are tested, um, uh, to get as many as possible treated for their latent infection. So, um, in, in your case, um, you will need to test everyone who's coming through for these um, adjustment of status exams, but many of you also have clinics outside of your civil surgeon practice um, and should be thinking about your patient's risk for tuberculosis and testing those who are at risk as well. Um, that, uh, that population of people who are infected with latent tuberculosis but haven't yet been who are either not aware of their status or maybe aware of their status that they have LTBI but it hasn't been treated, that represents an opportunity for prevention in our community. Um, so risk assessment for all patients is recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, the U.S. Preventive Task Force, the CDC, and of course, yours truly. Um, and, uh, you know, for those who are at elevated risk of infection or progression to disease, um, you want to test to treat. So in your role as civil surgeon, you'll be testing a lot of people. M many of the people that you'll test are from countries of high incidence or foreign born from countries of high incidence. And so these are people that you would want to seriously consider 
treating for their latent infection because um, uh, because they're at higher risk for progression. So risk factors for exposure. Um, this is the one that's going to be true for almost all of your status adjusters. Um, it, and um, other risk factors include known contact with a TB case at any time in your life, by national residence or lifestyle. This is another one that may come up frequently in, in our jurisdiction. Unpasteurized dairy consumption, such as raw milk, queso fresco, homelessness, incarceration, or drug abuse. Um, and um, I, I just wanted to include the country of birth specific incidence rate in San Diego County um, because we do have a lot of status adjusters coming from these countries, Mexico, Philippines, and Vietnam. And you can see th these are rates not for those countries, but for people who are foreign born from those countries living in San Diego County. Um, and you can see that the TB incidence rates of, uh, from Philippines and Vietnam, for example, are much higher than the county overall incidence rate of about 6.8 per 100,000 right now. Um, and you can also see that uh, Philippines and Vietnam have a much higher incidence than, say, Mexico. Um, where we have a lot of, we have a large um, Mexican-born population here in San Diego, so um, people may be more familiar with birth in Mexico as a risk factor than birth in Philippines or Vietnam. Um, risk factors for progression to disease include recent infection um, and recent, or recent contact with TB case, cancer, diabetes, HIV infection, these are all conditions that suppress the immune system, transplant, malnutrition, um, other immune suppression, um, and smoking. Please note that pregnancy is not on this list. Even though it is a state of relative immune suppression, um, it's not associated with an increased risk of progression to acid disease. And we do not re recommend routine testing of pregnant women simply because of their pregnancy status. Obviously, if a woman is adjusting her status and she's currently pregnant, we will test her because it's required for the, for the adjustment of status exam. Um, it's really important to take a step back and think about, you know, why we're doing this testing um, and recall that you really need to exclude active tuberculosis. Um, if the test is positive, or even before you do the test, if the symptom screen is positive. Um, so somebody who has a symptom of prolonged cough, night sweats, fevers, chills, weight loss, fatigue, or lymphadenopathy, you'll want to do a, a chest x-ray for sure, um, and a careful examination, including a lymph node exam. Um, so you'll do these for, for anyone with a positive TB test or with symptoms. Um, um, or the immune suppressed conditions um, that as required. Um, other diagnostic tests um, should be directed by your exam and x-ray findings. So somebody may have a clear chest x-ray, but if they have cervical lymph nodes, you'll want to get a biopsy. Um, anybody with a, an abnormal x-ray, you'll want to get three SPUDA for AFD, smear, and culture. And one of these should be, at least one of these should be sent for PCR. Remember, do not treat LTBI if you have sent, if you're, if the patient is undergoing a diagnostic workup and cultures are still pending, you do not want to initiate treatment for latent tuberculosis infection, even if you think the likelihood that the cultures will grow is low. Um, because you really do not want to be treating active TB with a single drug. Um, if you're not sure, for example, if you have a chest X-ray that has a small effusion and you're not sure whether you should get Buda or not, feel free to call us. Um, that's the intake reporting number, um, which was also in Dr. Moore's presentation and can be easily found on our website. Um, we can help with consultation about both treating LTBI and working up TB. <coughs> Um, <coughs> um, so you'll be testing everyone for TB as part of your adjustment of status exam, but um, I, I make the point here that 
you want to test for LTBI after you've excluded active TB. So this means in asymptomatic patients um, who you don't have, you, you're not concerned about working up active TB. Um, and the interferon gamma release assay is now required um, because it does not cross-react with BCG vaccination. And, and you're screening a highly BCG vaccinated population. Um, just a little background, I think many of you are familiar with this already, but um, the BCG vaccination is a live bacteria that's closely related to MTB. It's administered in infants and children in high prevalence countries and it's not routinely used here. It is 80% effective against the development of disseminated TB and TB meningitis, which is, a, which is particularly prevalent and uh, severe in young children. But it's less effective at preventing latent infection and pulmonary tuberculosis. Um, and it's not used here in the United States routinely. Um, another important point is that the IGRA and PSP cannot distinguish between latent infection and active disease. Um, and also please note that 10 to 20 percent of active TB cases will test negative. That is also true for the IGRA test, as, as you may be familiar with the TB, PSP test. So a negative IGRA does not mean that the patient does not have active disease. They're symptomatic and you're concerned that they could have active disease. Um, a negative IGRA test should not prevent you or discourage you from doing a full workup for active tuberculosis um, with, uh, with BUDA if you're concerned about the chest x-ray or following other diagnostic pathways if, for example, they have lymphadenopathy or localized symptoms in their spine or another area that makes you think they may have pul extra pulmonary tuberculosis. Um, patients with symptoms or positive tests should be evaluated for active TB disease and risk for progression. Thorough medical history, symptom screen, chest radiograph, and directed diagnostic testing. Um, we sort of already went through this about collecting sputa if, a, if there are symptoms of prolonged cough present or um, if a chest x-ray is abnormal. Um, and Again, just to reiterate, if a culture has been sent, you, you, can, you can start people on empiric therapy for tuberculosis if you think, based on imaging and your medical history and physical exam, that the patient very likely has TB. If you are starting someone on full therapy, um, empiric multidrug treatment, in spite of negative testing, be sure to report it to the local public health department even while testing is pending, anybody that you start on therapy for active TB needs to be reported within 24 hours. Um, you can also opt to await the final culture results to rule out active disease before starting therapy with one or two drugs for latent tuberculosis infection. Um, so I wanted to review some of the newer regimens for the treatment of latent tuberculosis infection. Um, isoniazid once daily for six to nine months has been the standard of care for many years, but um, in, in the last five, ten years, new therapies, which are shorter course and better tolerated, have, uh, been, have been tested and are now recommended by the CDC for the treatment of latent tuberculosis infection. Um, and are the preferred therapies because patients are more likely to tolerate and finish the course of therapy. So these are um, a rifapentine isoniazid uh, therapy, which is taken as <laughs> one dose one dose weekly of rifapentine and isoniazid for three months for a total of 12 doses. Um, and it's, you need to have the 12 doses completed within 16 weeks in order for it to be a complete course of therapy. Historically, it was recommended that this only be administered via directly observed therapy, but uh, recent data indicate that uh, it can be administered without directly observed therapy and still be effective. Um, you may want to be 
selective about which patients you use directly as their therapy or not. Um, another, uh, another one, which is um, probably the most popular one prescribed in our clinic, most popular with patients, um, because our providers generally offer, uh, will generally offer multiple types of therapy or help, help choose based on patient preferences as well, is the rifampin once daily for four months. Um, and um, it's the smaller daily pill burden um, and also uh, sometimes easier to remember to take pills daily than once a week. It doesn't require directly observed therapy either. Um, as you know, rifampin, um, but also rifapentine have myriad drug interactions. So it's critical that if you prescribe one of these regimens that you check for drug interactions with any medications that the patient may already be taking. And I'll go through a few of those um, later on in my slide. So just to reiterate, these two shorter course regimens are now recommended by the CDC and um, are tend to be more likely to be completed and better tolerated by patients. Um, so they are the preferred regimens over isoniazid. Isoniazid works, it works well. Um, there's a higher risk of liver toxicity with isoniazid, and there are also a few select populations um, in which uh, you may prefer the others because of the higher risk of liver toxicity with isoniazid. <coughs> so um, advantages of the rifampin regimen is it's um, less hepatotoxic. It tends to have greater adherence to treatment completion. Um, it does have multiple drug interactions, some common ones, warfarin, oral contraceptive, which can be managed with um, either a switch to a um, direct acting oral anticoagulant um, or by monitoring and adjusting the warfarin dose. Oral contraceptives um, and uh, individuals who are on oral contraceptives should use a barrier method while on rifampin. Uh, methadone, protease inhibitors, and tenofovir alafenamide. And there are many others, so it's important to actually check the interactions for any drugs that your patient is taking. Um, providers tend to have less experience using rifampin to treat LTDI because this is a relatively newly recommended therapy, so some providers are not comfortable with it. Feel free to reach out to us using that uh, reporting line if you have questions about starting one of these short course regimens and just we're happy to provide any support and advice that we can about them. It also may be more expensive for self-pay patients, um, approximately $40 a month. Um, weekly isoniazid and rifapentine. Um, it's for children, adults and children over two years old. Um, and uh, it's not an inferior to nine months of isoniazid in terms of um, effectiveness, um, but uh, you can't receive antiretroviral therapy and take this medication for the first 90 days. Um, so for people with HIV, uh, it may not be preferred. Um, it can now be administered via self-administered therapy. Um, and I included some of the, the uh, studies about, about this newer regimen at the bottom there. It's less hepatotoxic than isoniazid um, and also has greater adherence. There are multiple drug interactions similar to rifampin. It's also a large pill burden once a week. So some people will just look at the number of pills and say, no, no thanks. Um, there's also a flu-like hypersensitivity syndrome that does occur in uh, a little less than 4% of people. So it's important to educate, uh, educate your patients about the possibility of that and um, switch to a different regimen if you find that's happening. Um, it's very expensive for people who are uninsured, about $400 a month. Um, Medicaid is supposed, and Medi-Cal is supposed to cover all three of these regimens for LTBI. Um, and it's, um, but I guess uh, you have to you have to figure out you know whether your patients have insurance and can get it covered because that will definitely be a barrier for some people. 
Um, in terms of prioritizing who should be treated for um, tuberculosis infection in San Diego County, uh, the people who will be screened in your adjustment of status exams generally fall into uh, um, category one, um, although they may not be recent, but contacts to infect infectious cases and recent immigrants from high burden countries. Um, people with HIV AIDS, children under five and adolescents, um, diabetes, people who are on dialysis and or who have other medical risk factors for progression, and people who have exposure in high-risk congregate settings like a nursing home, shelter, or prison. Um, most of the people who you will evaluate in your adjustment of status exam um, would be a, somebody that we would prioritize for treatment because they're foreign-born from a, a high-burden country. Um, special considerations about LTBI treatments include people who are pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, Isonize is preferred, but you actually, for someone with latent infection, you, have, you, you need to get a chest x-ray to rule out active disease and a thorough symptom review. But unless they, if they have active disease, you're going to report them to public health and we'll get them treated and we'll, we will hold your hand through that. Um, but uh, if they are pregnant and this is latent infection, um, you, you would only want to treat them immediately if they were high risk. For example, a known contact to a case. If there's someone who, this is just the first time they've been tested for TB and, um, and you know, and they, and they have a positive IGRA test, but they've never been tested before, so you can't say that this is like a, a recent conversion or recent infection. Um, it would be most appropriate to wait uh, until two to three months postpartum because there's an increased risk of hepatotoxicity in pregnancy. <clears throat> um, for children under two, you would not want to use the combination therapy. You would use either the rosampin four months or the isoniazid treatment. And you should also report them to TB control because um, by definition, it's a recent infection um, and there's often a household contact that's the case. Um, people with renal insufficiency, you may need to consider dose adjustment and administer the treatment post dialysis. Um, if you have someone that you're evaluating who you know is a contact to a resistant case, be sure that you're not treating the, their latent infection with a drug that their, their TB is likely to be resistant to. So if the case is an isoniazid resistant case, they would need to be treated with rifampin. If the case is an MDR case, you would want to treat with a fluoroquinolone if the MDR case is susceptible. Um, and I, you know, anytime if you have a situation like that, I would recommend getting in touch with us um, because if we're not already aware of your contact as a contact to the MDR case, we would definitely want to know about it. And we can certainly help you with making decisions about treatment. Um, in terms of treatment monitoring, baseline lab tests are recommended for those with liver disease, alcohol use, pregnancy, or HIV. Um, and if the, the baseline tests are abnormal, you would want to monitor the liver test monthly. Um, or if anyone, regardless of whether they had baseline testing or not, developed any symptoms of hepatitis, you want to hold the medications and test liver enzymes. And if they're more than three times the upper limit of normal with symptoms, you would want to hold. Um, if you're just monitoring liver tests because they had one of those baseline risk factors, they're asymptomatic, but their liver tests are going up. As long as they remain asymptomatic, you can continue treating them unless the enzymes get above five times the upper limit of normal. Um, I just have one minute left, so I'm going to breeze through our TB elimination um, initiative. Oh, I have more time? Oh, okay, wonderful. I have 10 minutes left. Great. Um, so San Diego County, um, is initiating a TB elimination initiative. Um, this is a board approved action and aligns with state and federal initiatives in TB elimination. 
Um, the initiative goal is to decrease the incidence of active TB to one case per million by 2040. Why now? Why is now the time to pursue an initiative like this? Well, we have better diagnostic methods, um, particularly for a, a, a large portion of our at-risk population, which is foreign-born and BCG vaccinated, that's the IGRA. We have better treatments with this short course therapy, and um, there are new guidelines which uh, further support um, and reinforce risk-based testing. Also, there's mobilization at a global, federal, state, and now local level. Um, so, some agencies, some of, some of the agencies, I should say, that are involved in um, building the public health framework for the TB elimination initiative include the CDC Division of TB Elimination, the California State Department of Public Health, um, and uh, locally, the San Diego County Department of Public Health. There are also some non-governmental agencies um, that, uh, that are involved in the public health framework including National TB Controllers Association, the California TB Controllers Association, and California TB Elimination Action Committee. And locally, we have um, Partners in TB Elimination, a group that's been meeting um, two to three times a year to develop and support tuberculosis elimination in San Diego County. Uh, the goal of uh, eliminating TB in San Diego County um, is, I think, achievable but challenging. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, uh, incidence of tuberculosis in San Diego County has been pretty level for the last five years or so. Um, and we're really going to need to change how we approach TB prevention in order to bend the curve on TB incidence. Um, so you can see that to achieve elimination by 2040, we would need to start having a decrease in incidence of about 16% per year um, given, current, given current incidence rates. And that given that 75 to 80% of cases are reactivation of latent infection, what that means is getting people who are infected treated before they become active cases. Um, stakeholders and um, the stakeholders in this action include um, the patient, first and foremost, and then um, the support system that um, interacts with these individuals. And um, this, includes, this includes healthcare providers, particularly civil surgeons, because um, as a group, you diagnose a lot of the latent tuberculosis that's diagnosed in high-risk individuals in San Diego County because these are people who are foreign-born from countries of high incidence. So as civil surgeons, you, and also as primary care providers, as many of you are, and urgent care providers, as many of you are, you play a key role in identifying people who are at risk for developing tuberculosis. Um, and your counseling of them so that they understand their risk and your initiation of treatment or referring them to an appropriate place where they can get treatment um, is a really important step in getting these individuals uh, treated for TB so that they don't go on to develop disease later in their life um, or infect others. Um, so um, we do, as part of our TB elimination initiative, we're forming a planning group. The first meeting for the planning group is going to be on October 2nd, 4 p.m. If you're interested to attend, please contact us using um, the contact information that's going to be at the end of this lecture. And um, the goal is an evidence-based approach to implement risk-based TB screening and LTBI treatment. Um, in the first meeting, we'll get an overview. You'll get We'll deliver an overview of um, populations at risk and initiative goals. We'll define work groups for different stakeholders and set a timeline to define goals and work plans for the different stakeholder groups. Stakeholders can, in can include occupational health, civil surgeons, primary care, military, schools, universities, shelters and drug treatment programs, correctional facilities, to name a few. Um, 
thank you so much for attending this webinar and for sticking it out to the end of the webinar. Um, after my presentation, there's going to be an opportunity for questions. Um, I do want to announce that I will be departing as the Chief of Tuberculosis Control in San Diego County. Um, and so my contact information is up there, and for the rest of the week, that email will work. Um, but if you contact me going forward, what you'll get is a redirection to um, several different um, members of my branch who will be able to help you with your questions. Um, Dr. Ening Chang will be the interim medical director upon my departure, um, and Dr. Marisa Moore, who uh, spoke earlier, oversees uh, surveillance and reporting of TB um, and can be great resources. Marty Brentmill is our education and outreach coordinator, and I did a lot of the coordination of um, outreach regarding this webinar, and she's also an excellent resource in terms of um, uh, both TB elimination and also um, can help direct you to the right resource if you have, if you think you may have a case of active TB on your hands or you just have a question about latent tuberculosis infection. The Surveillance and Reporting Advice Line is the place to call with those types of questions. Um, and the number is there, 619-692-8610. Thanks so much for joining us. And I'll open it, I'll give the mic back to Kelly. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Graves, and thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, we would like to take a few moments now to open for questions from our participants. Uh, we're going to begin first with questions via the phone. So I did, we did mute all of the phone lines at the beginning of this training, and that was in order to preserve the audio quality for the recording that we'll be posting online. If you'd like to ask a question over the phone, please dial star six on your phone to unmute yourself. And I will pause for a moment to see if there's any phone questions coming through. Okay, so we do have a few questions coming in on the chat. I would like to encourage if anybody would like to press star six on their phone to unmute. Um, to ask a question directly, um, we, we would appreciate that. So we do have a couple chat questions. We'll start um, reading them out, and then we'll invite our presenters to respond. Um, so the, the first question here is for pregnant patients. Do we not sign the forms until after they get the x-ray done at a safe time period? Um, so I'm going to jump in here um, for, from the TB control standpoint. A pregnant patient who's had a positive TB test needs a chest X-ray. Um, it could be done with shielding, but uh, you don't want to wait to get the chest X-ray because the reason for doing the TB testing is to identify people who have active tuberculosis. Um, and since you would want to get a pregnant woman started on TB therapy for active tuberculosis as soon as possible, uh, you would not want to delay the chest x-ray. Thank you, Dr. Graves. Okay, um, the next question that I see here is, when filling out immigration forms, how do we verify identification for children? Um, so, I don't know if Laura or Dr. Posey would like to respond to that. Hi, this is Laura. Um, so for children, generally, obviously, they're not going to have the same kind of photo IDs that we have. Um, we do encourage people to bring as much as they have, though. Um, a lot of times, the applicants will have a foreign passport for the child. Um, if that is not possible, then a, a birth certificate um, would be would be sufficient in most cases, um, but again, if, if there's any questions, then please document the, the um, ID or lack of ID that the person brought in and um, put that in your notes when you are submitting it. Great, thank you very much, Laura. 
Okay, I see another question here in the chat. Um, for I-693 forms, if the IGRA is positive but the chest X-ray is negative, just want to confirm I can finish their forms, no signs or symptoms of TB. So, Dr. Posey, would you like to, I see that you've um, written a response. Would you like to add anything to that or share your response out loud, please? Yes, um, great question. So if the applicant has a positive IGRA test and a negative X-ray, no signs or symptoms, so everything else very reassuring, the I-693 can be finalized, we're talking about as it relates to tuberculosis, and given to the applicant, and, and then the uh, civil surgeon can do the reporting to the health department for the case of latent TB. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Posey. All right, the next question I see here um, as a civil surgeon, um, so do we just need to report the LTBI to the health department, but we as civil surgeons won't be held responsible for uh, consequences of LTBI? I think they're referring to the um, LTBI treatment or treatment completion. <clears throat> Dr. Posey, would you like to comment on that or Dr. Graves? Um, I can comment on that. Um, I think, you know, as medical providers, the responsibility is to counsel the patient appropriately on their risk and recommend treatment, which is which um, is indicated in most cases um, among uh, status adjusters because they are at risk. Um, although, as as you would with any patient, you 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 as a provider would want to help advise them regarding risks and benefits of any therapy. Um, if you um, if you are not able or or the patient you know wouldn't want to continue to get treatment at your clinic, you can refer them to another appropriate clinic. And with I know with one of our outreach emails, we sent a list of clinics by region where uh, LTBI treatment can be performed. Um, so uh, you know I, we can uh, resend that um, as a follow up to this. Um, webinar as well, uh, appropriate places to refer people for LTBI treatment. Thank you. Okay, the next question that has come up, um, if patients come and tell me they have gotten treatment in the past, should they be reported again? And I mean, we need to clarify, are we talking about LTBI treatment or active right. TB treatment? I, so um, that question was from Hector um, Heredia Martinez. Um, Hector, if you'd like to add to that in the chat, we can see that you're typing right now. If you could just clarify if your question relates. Okay, LTBI treatment. Okay, a patient has come to me, they've gotten LTBI treatment in the past. Should they be reported again? For the purposes of the civil service, uh, sorry, civil surgeon um, evaluations. Uh, I guess this is a new question and we have to consider our policy, but for now I would say report. Mm -hmm. um, particularly, it, it, just report and report together with the information that it, the patient reported to you that it was treated in the past. Thank you, and, and Dr. Posey or Laura, do you have anything you'd like to add or comment? related to that? Uh, this is uh, Dr. Posey. No, I do not have anything to add to that. Thank you. Um, I see a question from Denise Gomez. Are LTBI, all LTBI now required to be reported? Um, the answer to that is no for now. Um, that is probably coming down the line at the state level. Um, and there, uh, there are new um, laboratory reporting requirements of positive IGRAs from labs. Um, this doesn't yet apply to providers in the community. Um, but I anticipate in the coming years, probably, a uh, few years, um, eventually LTBI will be a reportable condition. For now, this only applies to your surgeon adjustment of status exam and those special cases like children under the age of two. Thank you. 
Okay, uh, the next question here, uh, do we send the patient to a pulmonologist or infectious disease specialist or leave it to the health department to take care of? Um, if you're speaking about uh, active tuberculosis, um, most about 80% of our cases in San Diego County are managed in the community by um, either uh, primary care doctors or pulmonologists or infectious disease specialists. Um, it's not required that they see a pulmonologist or infectious disease specialist. Um, if you want to be the person who treats an active case, um, we can support you through that um, because we have excellent nurse case management and we also have medical consultation available to you. Um, if you do not feel comfortable treating a TB case and you want to refer them elsewhere, we can help you find a place to refer them, um, which includes potentially our clinic. Our clinic sees patients who are uninsured um, as well as uh, some insured patients depending on what, what community resources are available to them um, and we'll work with you to find a place for those folks to get treated. For people with latent tuberculosis infection, um, I'm going to refer again to the, we actually have like a pretty extensive list of places where they can be referred for LTBI treatment. And um, that can generally be done in a primary care office. Does not require a, like a pulmonologist. I don't even know if they would accept that referral. Infectious disease probably would, um, but it can easily be treated by a primary care provider. It, the treatment is much less onerous and complex. Um, and I would encourage you to, um, if you don't currently, um, if you if you do um, treatment in your clinic, but you're not currently doing LTBI treatment, we would like to work with you to help capacitate your clinic to be able to treat LTBI because um, it's an important part of medical care, and it's um, there's uh, there five percent of the population is infected, and many people will need treatment. So we're we're happy to help capacitate that. Thank you. Um, all right, we may have time for one to two additional questions. Um, I'm just scanning the chat window here. I see a question from Dr. Alfredo uh, Quinonia. Who fills out and prepares part, it looks like a secondary part of the, the form. Um, Dr. Alfredo, would you like to clarify which part? where I'm guessing this is relating to the I-693 form. <clears throat> we'll pause for a moment while I can see Dr. Alfredo is typing. Hi, yes. Part four, Hi, thank uh, you. I can answer that. Um, thank so yeah, you. we had a slide on that. The, it's a new section on the new 693, the preparer section. Um, this is part, this is the applicant's portion. So the civil surgeons in general should not have to worry about this portion. Only if um, if they if the applicant comes to them and somebody in their office or the civil surgeon themselves completely fills out the entire form for them from uh, blank, should they need to fill that portion out. Other than that, if nobody else helps prepare the uh, form for them, then it can be just left blank. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, one other question. If positive IGRA, negative X-ray, LTBI, which option do we check off in page nine, part, B, uh, part eight? Um, sorry, the chat moved there. Um, Laura, is that something that you would like to respond to or is that something that's better to um, follow up via the email address that you provided here. Yes, that would be better as a follow up. Okay, thank you. All right, I think at so if Dr. Toledo, if you could please send in that uh, question uh, via email to the email address that is provided here. Um, in the chat window, OPS Civil Surgeons at, oh, um, at uscis.dhs.gov. So the chat window has been adjusted, and I'm actually 
not able to adjust it back. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to now return back to the slides and we're going to um, conclude uh, today's webinar. So thank you again uh, for um, all of the participants staying on to the end and to all of our presenters. I would like to quickly mention that the State of California Tuberculosis Control Program has organized um, a, a separate webinar for civil surgeons, and it's scheduled for next Wednesday, September 25th at noon Pacific time. It's going to cover different but related content. So any of you who are on the line, if this was not something you are already aware of, if you're interested in registering, we did post the flyer with the full information and registration link in the online materials folder today. Um, so we would encourage you to register for that if you're interested. Um, otherwise, I would like to just give you all a friendly reminder um, to please complete your online Qualtrics evaluation within one week. Uh, CME, nursing CEU, or participation certificates will be available on the Curry Center website within 12 weeks. And we will send you each an email when the certificates are available. <clears throat> One last reminder before you all log off, any group members or individuals who may not have pre-registered, please provide us with your full name and email address by entering it into the chat window or by sending an email to the course.currytvcenter email listed here. Then we can send you an online evaluation to complete. Please feel free to contact us at the Curry Center if you have any questions or concerns. And for your convenience, I will leave the Adobe Connect connection open for another five minutes or so to allow you the opportunity to input your information. All right, thank you very much.